So this, I guess, you know, y'all remember, uh, make sure this is on here. Okay. Remember uh, Paul's Harvey, Paul Harvey's uh, The Rest of the Story. And I guess this would be uh, part two or the rest of the story, really, from last week. And uh, when we think about when we think about the Christian life, we sometimes forget that there's more than one aspect of God and one, more than one aspect of God's uh, ex expectation of us. And so if we think about what is it that God is asking of us today and what does He require I think Romans would be a good place to end up. So we begin with the cross and God's love for us. And we really uh, touched on that uh, many times. But we must remember there's another side of the Christian life. Uh, you may think you get a pass just because God is kind and loving and all that. But just, any, just like any parent, uh, we expect certain things of our children. And just because we love them doesn't mean we're going to get, let them get by with just anything. We have certain expectations and requirements of them. And so uh, that's what we're looking at today. What God is really asking and what God is really looking for from you and me is what I call radical transformation. And the scripture was read about do not be conformed to this world. And, you know, we don't listen to the news or uh, the, uh, the surveys to find out how we should determine how we live. We shouldn't be conformed, but transformed. And there's a difference. And so Paul begins this passage with an appeal, an urge to each and every one of us. And what is it that he's really asking of us? What is it that we need to be transformed and not conformed? And first of all, uh, if you're writing this down, the first one is this. There is a call for commitment. He's given us this appeal for a commitment. And he says, I urge you or I appeal to you that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, the readers of Paul's day would have automatically understood what he was talking about when he talked about a sacrifice. Because in the, uh, in the Torah, the first five books of Moses, they had all the, uh, the wording and the regulations and instruction of how to give a sacrifice. And they understood that a sacrifice was something that was usually given uh, on the altar and it involved a death. In fact, it wasn't just a death. It was a bloody mess. I like the term messy grace because it really is, if you think about it. Jesus, the Bible says he died on the cross and it wasn't just uh, like we see in pictures. It was probably a bloody mess because he became the Lamb of God for the whole world. And if we understand what a sacrifice really represents, it's hard for us to picture. But when the priest was finished offering this sacrifice, there was, it looked like, it, well, it was a slaughter. It was a slaughter. And if you think about a slaughter, and you think about, uh, you know, even uh, when a person or an animal is, is killed in that manner, there's going to be blood everywhere. Now, I don't want to gross you out this morning, but I want you to understand that a sacrifice requires something. A sacrifice for the lamb that was offered, it required his entire life. This lamb was laying down his life. So Jesus, when John said, behold, the lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world, he understood that this lamb was going to be the sacrifice for the whole world. You see, God can't just say, well, yeah, I'm just going to let you go into heaven just like that. No, there had to be a sacrifice. And so the writers, uh, the readers of, his, uh, of Hebrews would have understood what that was all about. 
But then he says something that which, which really is an oxymoron. It's really saying, he says to us that we are to become living sacrifices. In other words, not that uh, we're going to just give up our lives, but that we are going to sacrificially live. We're going to die as we're living, in a sense. Our, our whole life has become a sacrifice. And He's not asking us here to take our lives, but to give our lives. And in a sense, we become living sacrifices. How do we understand what that really means today? What is He really saying when He's saying that we are to become a living sacrifice? And it really involves our whole life. You see, the Christian life is not just what we do on Sunday morning. But it's who we are. At some point in our lives, you know, we, we, get, we get saved, hopefully. We give our life to Christ, or you know, we ask Him to come in our life. But that's just part of it. At some point, uh, and I think you can get into the Wesleyan understanding of um, really holiness or perfection here, when you begin to understand that God is requiring something more beyond the initial salvation. We could say, well, I'm saved, that's it, there's nothing more, no more to it. No. Paul is saying, I, God is encouraging, actually, I'm urging you to give your life to God. Now, that's saying, not that I'm just going to, I'm going to know God and go to church, but I'm all in. That's what it means to be a sacrifice. You're all in. Now, think of it in this way, Think of the child prodigies today. In January uh, 2019, a Russian pianist, uh, LC, actually UC Meissen, I think is the way you pronounce that, walked onto a stage, which was about 600 miles uh, e due east of Moscow, and it was a packed house. And he... Uh, had this, uh, you know, tuxedo on, and, and, and the, the back of it just kind of flowed with his uh, blonde hair, and he walked over to the piano to a standing ovation, sat down and adjusted the piano seat to his height, and began to play some beautiful music like Mozart's. When, the, when he finished playing, the crowd went crazy, and asked for an encore, to which he gave them an encore. And they continued to cheer. And when it was over, he walked off the stage and bowed, walked off into the arms of his mother, who took him home, read him a bedtime story, and put him to bed. You see, he was only eight years old at this time. And then think about Anna Jiyun Lee who had her debut as a violinist when she performed one of those same type of songs, Pajani's Violin Concerto Number no. 1. This is a, kind of above me, to be honest with you. But she performed this with a sim, uh, Singapore Symphony uh, in Orchestra when she was only six years old. Now, a few years ago, someone came out with a book called The 10,000 Hour Rule, Malcolm Gladwell. And this 10,000 hour rule said that you can become an expert at about anything if you practice 20 hours a week. That if you practice 20 hours a week, by the time you're uh, in, within 10 years, you can become an expert. But hold on a minute. Uh, on a ji Yoon Lee was only six years old at the time. You know, she only, <laughs> she had not lived 10,000 hours. And yet here she is at six years old. She's an expert. I mean, by the time that she had to do her potty training and, uh, you know, sleeping and, you know, the routines of daily lives, she didn't have 10,000 hours. But yet here she is at six years old as a child prodigy. Well, 
the writer of this book says that this doesn't count for everything. It doesn't count for violinists, and it doesn't count for pianos. It doesn't count for professional sports. He said even himself that he could practice for 10,000 hours and he wouldn't be a world-class chess player. But yet, the point he was trying to make is that if we put the time, if we have the talent, now here's the thing, if you can't sing, you can't sing, but if you, if, if you can't, uh, if you can't uh, play a piano, if that's just not your thing, it is just not your thing. And I'm not saying you can't learn to do it. But that doesn't mean that just because you want to do it and you put the time in, you're going to be an expert at it. There has to be some level of skill and some natural talent. But if you have the natural talent and you put the time in, then it, the payoff is amazing. If you look at some of the child prodigies today and all the people that are doing great things, they put the time in to do it. They've sacrificed other things to be able to be where they are. Now, bring that into Romans chapter 12. And let's look at what he says there. I mean Hebrews. I'm sorry, Romans. I'm, I'm in Hebrews. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you. The King James says, I beseech you, or I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In other words, you need to be all in. If you want to do this thing and do it right, you need to be all in. You can't be half in and half out. And he said, this is our spiritual worship. Giving our lives as a living sacrifice is our worship. So worship is not just what we do on Sunday morning. Worship is who we are. It's where we turn our lives over to God as a living sacrifice. And we're worshiping God. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. By the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the idea there is that we are allowing God to change us. And so the first is a call for commitment. The second, number two, there's a call for change. There's a call for change. You guys have heard me say this a lot. But I think it's true, and it needs repeating, that God loves us just the way we are. But He loves us way too much to leave us that way. Hear me when I say that one thing that the Scripture teaches us is that, we, that, that God is all about transforming and changing us. I'm not saying He changes who we are in the sense of our, our being, but in the sense that God wants to make us better. He wants to bring us closer. And, you know, when we begin to read the Bible and we begin to reflect on the Scriptures and when we begin, begin to hear the teachings of other people and even in the course of conversations with people wiser than us, if we're honest and truthful with ourselves and we begin to reflect, we will realize there's areas in our lives that need to change. I need to be more loving or I need to be more uh, consistent with this, whatever. But it's all about change. Stanford professor Carol Dweck uh, said there's basically two types of mindsets. One is the growth mindset and the other is the fixed mindset. The growth mindset says this, I am uh, not going to allow my uh, disappointments and failures to define me. And I understand that these can be learning experiences and I'm going to use them to become better and stronger. That's the growth mindset. The fixed mindset says, well, I am who I am. And my failures are, are evidence that I'm never going to be able to amount to much of anything. Now, I'm, I'm, of course, putting it in very simple terms. But that's what it really comes down to. The growth mindset 
and the fixed mindset. But I want to say, suggest to you that the Apostle Paul gives a third mindset. And that's the transformative mindset. That is the mindset that says, you know, I'm not what I want to be. And I'm not what I'm going to be. But thank God I'm not what I was. But understanding that I am being transformed. I'm being renewed. And God is doing a work in me. He's still working on me, by the way. He's still doing this work. And it's an ongoing thing. And failure doesn't mean that God is finished with me. Or that I'm not able to amount to anything. But sometimes it means that God has something better. I've shared with you all some of my stories. And how that God has used some of the things in my life that, that were at the time felt like a failure. And God has used those things to push me in other directions. And so sometimes when you find yourself in a situation where things don't work out like you thought they should, that maybe God has something better in mind for you. And later on down the road you can look back and say, you know what? At the time I didn't really understand it. But now I realize that God had a plan and God had something better for me all along. That's part of that transformation thing. And so God has called us for a commitment. And there's a call for change. To be transformed. To understand that, that we don't get a pass because we love God and He loves us. But God is transforming us. And then the third thing is this. There's a call for community. You see this in... Uh, in the passage there, when he talks about, uh, he goes on to say, I say to everyone among you in verse 3, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Now he's not talking about putting yourself down here, but not to think more highly. Because, he says, God gives each of us a measure of faith. And as one body has many members, not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are the one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And he mentioned several there. And the, and the point there is that, that God wants us to have the right kind of mindset because in order to be in community with one another, we have to have that. We can't have the mindset of I'm better than them or they're better than me. And we can't be thinking, boy, you know, I'm not much because I can't preach. Or I'm not much because I can't sing. Or I'm not much because I can't do what Michelle does or what someone else does. I am who I am. But understand that God has something, given you something, a gift that you can use in the ministry and in the community. And you got to find out what that is, what you're good at, and what your passion is, and you begin to do that. But we have to understand that if we think that, you know, if we get to thinking, you know, boy, I'm, nobody's as good as me. I remember one time a, a fellow that I knew back years ago was a great, he was a pretty good piano player. And we walked out of church, and there was another guy got up to play the piano who wasn't quite as good. And when we walked out to the side, I was talking to this guy who was a really good. And he said, I bet that fellow in there that was playing that piano thought, boy, I can't play as good as him. I thought, you know, you just, you know, you just ruined it for me. I didn't want to hear him anymore after that. But the truth is that we're all called to community. We all have different gifts. And we all need to find out what that gift is. And be able to use that gift. And we can all do something in the kingdom of God. So we've been called to this community. And so if we think about this idea that we're committed and we're all in. What if everybody decided today I'm all in for the cause of Christ. And I'm going to commit to this cause. And I'm going to become a living sacrifice. And I'm going to be willing to do what it, what it takes to transform into the kingdom of God. And I'm going to live in community. We could turn the world upside down. What do you call a group like that? The church. It's called the church. And I'm saying to you today that God expects something from you and I. And don't think that you know, we have to be perfect and we have to do everything perfect. Because that's not what God is looking for. 
God is looking for people today who are willing to come to Him and say, Lord, here I am. It's like somebody said one time, you go home, you get a piece of chalk and you draw a circle and you stand in that circle and you say, God, you start a revival right here in this circle. See, I don't have time to worry about what your problems are. I've got enough of my own and all I'm saying today is I want to say to God, I'm all in. A few years ago, I started taking classes with the uh, called Clinical Pastoral Education. And it was, a, it was a big sacrifice. It involved driving to Louisville every, every Monday morning and coming back late Monday night. And I was exhausted. Three and a half hours one way. 1,600 hours of practical and clinical education. And I'm still not finished. It's a whole lot more paperwork. And I'm in the application process now, waiting on interviews. And there was two or three times I got, uh, when I sent my application in, I got a letter back saying, this isn't right, or this isn't the right format, or they want you to do this, or you left out a box that was supposed to be checked. And I was, I was saying to you, I said, I, I just don't know. I'm just about ready to quit. And thankfully, she's like, you can't do that. You've worked too hard for this, and you don't, don't give up. It's okay. You can do this. And she encouraged me to go back and hit the books and do it again, and I did. And finally, I got a letter saying, your application has been accepted, and now we are going to set you up for interviews in the fall. But you know, the truth is, if you've ever done anything worthwhile, some of you who have degrees and different things, you know what I'm talking about. You can't, uh, you know, I, I've known people who've gone to college, young people especially, who go down there and party the whole first year and wonder why they fail their classes and come home. You can't do anything like that if you're not all in. You've got to be, you've got to be willing to make some sacrifices. And that means there's going to be some nights whenever all your friends are out having fun and you're going to have to hit the books. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You're like, man, everybody else is having fun and here I am. I'm studying. And, and, but yet, listen to this. One of these days, it'll be worth it all. Because when you have achieved what you wanted to achieve and everybody else is still out there having fun and they're probably dying from that fun, you will, have, you, have, you will be able to say, it was worth it. It was worth it. This commitment that God is calling us to is not an easy thing. A sacrifice is not something that's fun. It's a bloody mess. But God's not calling us to take our lives. He's calling us to give our lives as a living sacrifice. I want to ask you to do that today. I want to ask you to make that appeal uh, confirm to God today as the musicians come and heads are bowed. Would you pray with me? And as we're getting ready to pray, if you just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I want to be all in for God. I want to do what God requires of me. And I want you to pray for me. Would you raise your hand? God bless that hand. God bless those hands. God sees those hands. Amen. Hands, many hands, church. Father, right now, we want to pray for everyone who raised their hand and those who couldn't. God, we ask you to help us. God, we know that sometimes we, we start out on this race and we feel like we're doing so well and then we fall and we feel like giving up. Or sometimes, Lord, it's just so hard. But God, you, you help us along the way. and you, you let us know by your example, God, that it's worth the effort. And it's worth the sacrifice. And so I pray you'd bless everyone here today. Help us, the Lord, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you today to continue to think and pray about what we just talked about. You find yourself a little altar somewhere, if not here, somewhere. I remember when I was a student at Asbury Seminary. One of my teachers, after talking about this kind of thing, invited us and let us uh, leave class early to go find a place to make our commitment to God. 
And I'm going to ask you to do that today because I believe that it's very important that we be all in. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you today. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen.